Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. Um, my name is Hafsa Halawa. I'm a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute, and uh, I'm very happy to be invited by Carnegie's Middle East Programme and Dr. Michelle Dunn to moderate this very timely discussion on Egypt today. Um, today, our panel will be discussing enduring challenges in Egypt in a time of pandemic challenges faced um, by the COVID-19 crisis, ongoing issues related to uh, domestic freedoms with continuing arrests of journalists and actors, as well as the public health crisis. Egypt is uh, increasingly um, under the gun enduring security challenges that have reached an inflection point, including Nile water access and the ongoing stalemate with the tripartite countries over the Gerd Dam in Ethiopia, the escalation in Libya and questions of Egypt's military engagement and ongoing insurgency in Sinai and the effect uh, not just of that, but of the pandemic on marginalized communities in the Sinai Peninsula and also other places such as uh, the Nubian community. Um, we are going to have a 30 to 40 minute discussion with our excellent panel that I will introduce to you shortly. Uh, and then we'll open up for questions. Please note, uh, I'm sure everybody is perfectly versed on uh, Zoom and webinar etiquette uh, to date after the, the months of lockdown but you can submit your questions at any time in the chat window via YouTube. Uh, you can also submit uh, anonymous or private questions via email to middleeast at ceip.org. That's middleeast at ceip.org. This panel is the third and final of a three event series hosted by Carnegie's Middle East program entitled Egypt Faces the Pandemic. The first event on health and economic effects and the second event related to politics, rights and global dynamics are both available for viewing on YouTube and via the Carnegie website. And I thoroughly encourage those who haven't yet had a chance to see them to go and, uh, and access that, um, those discussions. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to introduce our panelists today, this afternoon. Uh, we have three phenomenal Egyptian speakers with us. Mahmoud Farouk is the Program Coordinator for Civil Society Partnerships at the Project on Middle East Democracy in the United States in Washington, DC. Sharif al Ashmawi is an Associate Analyst with Control Risks Global Risk Analysis Team, leading the analysis on North Africa based in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. And Sharif Mohideen is a non-resident fellow at the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut. Welcome to all three of you and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, again, just to repeat, our, after our panel discussions, uh, we'll open up for questions. So please uh, remember, questions are open from now, so please feel free to submit your questions even during the panel discussion, um, as I mentioned, by email or via the YouTube chat. So thank you to the three of you for joining. We're going to dive right in straight away and turn to you, you uh, Sharif Lashmewi, uh, to discuss Libya. Um, the conflict in Libya obviously has shifted dramatically in recent weeks. Um, how would you, uh, how do you view Egypt's assessment of the current situation and their priorities uh, in regards to the conflict? Would you argue that Haftar is still a major part of the policy or no longer? Well, thank you, Hafsa. Um, it's a real pleasure to be on, on this panel. Um, I think to, to, to understand Egypt's concerns regarding Libya, I think we need to remember that um, Libya is, is the only country in North Africa and arguably in, in the MENA region as well, uh, where the post-2011 Arab Spring questions uh, remain unsettled. Uh, these relate to the ideological orientation of the political establishment, uh, the foreign alliances and the model of governance. And, uh, there remains a great deal of fluidity in, in, in Libya, which partly explains the kind of regional competition that we've been seeing uh, over the past decade uh, and are playing out more intensely now uh, as we speak um, in order to shape the future of Libya. So just to give a sort of a very quick uh, summary of the changing dynamics in the Libyan conflict. Um, so over the past two months, we've seen a complete reversal of the tides 
as the forces aligned with the government of national accord in Tripoli, um, supported by Turkish drones, equipment, and uh, uh, fighters uh, slash mercenaries, were able to force the Libyan National Army, which is Egypt's ally, to retreat from northwestern Libya, uh, which effectively meant the end of the Tripoli uh, offensive that was launched uh, in, in April 2019 by the Libyan National Army to capture the capital Tripoli. Uh, the result of this was that the GNA, the, the Government of National Accord Alliance groups, uh, became on the offensive now with ongoing attempts to uh, build on the momentum um, to capture more territory in central and eastern Libya at the expense of the LNA. Specifically now, this is playing out around uh, the areas of, of Sirte on the central coastal, uh, on, on central coastal, uh, in central coastal Libya, uh, as well as the central Jofra district. Um, so the, the way Egypt views this uh, development is, is definitely with a great deal of concern. Uh, it has invested significant capital in its relationship with the LNA uh, since 2014. Um, as a security partner on, on, its, uh, on its Western border. And now it's seeing these forces uh, collapsing in the advancing, uh, in the face of the advancing uh, uh, GNA aligned groups with potential, with potential ramifications uh, for the cohesiveness of the LNA in Eastern Libya as well. And it's, it's also seeing a plethora of militias affiliated with the GNA, including Islamist elements that are hostile to Egypt because of its support uh, uh, to, the, to the LNA in recent years advancing eastwards and backed by uh, regional rivals of Egypt, mainly Turkey and to a lesser extent, uh, Qatar. So in terms of Egypt's priorities, uh, I think there are two key priorities. First of all is security, the security of the 1200 kilometer uh, border that, uh, that separates Egypt from Libya, um, which has been a hotspot of smuggling activity and militant infiltration uh, uh, since 2011, uh, which affected security in the Western des des desert of Egypt as well as in North uh, Sinai. And Egypt in, in recent years has made, has made uh, a lot of progress in um, sort of cracking down on the cross-border smuggling activity, um, which has been reflected in the improvement in the security environment in, in the Western desert, but also in reduced, um, uh, which reduced the, the weapon smuggling that reached the Sinai Peninsula. And this is now coming to the fore again with the potential for instability in, in Eastern Libya. Um, part of this, security of tens of thousands of Egyptian workers who are based in Libya. And we've seen a flavor of that already with the detention and mistreatment of a number of Egyptians in, in the town of Tarhuna in, in the Northwest uh, earlier this month, which uh, uh, before the issue was resolved later. Another key priority I think is, is ensuring that the political order in Eastern Libya is not hostile to Cairo, to Egypt. Uh, Egypt is wary of having a government controlling Eastern Libya and that government having Islamist tendencies uh, and the Turkish and Qatari support, which would have, of course, political and security ramifications for, for Egypt down the road. Also, the significance of the CERT Jofra red line that, that uh, President Sisi communicated uh, during his speech last weekend is that if, if the GNA captures uh, the city of Sirt, it would easily uh, take control of the oil ports, um, which is called the oil crescent, um, and, and the Sirt basins oil fields. And, and this, is, th this would be a major gain for the LNA and would, uh, uh, j just because oil is one of the last cards that the LNA and the Eastern authorities uh, still have against, still hold against the GNA, given the, the ongoing oil blockade uh, uh, since, since January uh, uh, this year, uh, which has reduced the flow of revenue to the GNA. So just the, the, the last part or the last point uh, that I want to raise is, is about whether Haftar is still part of, of the policy or not. And I think in, in, in the past few weeks, we've seen indications that uh, there is an increasing frustration uh, with Haftar um, uh, from Egypt and from the other foreign backers of the LNA. Uh, his importance will be less pronounced now as there is a significant focus on the potential for a political solution. Um, and in, in Sisi's speech, uh, I think we, we, we all noticed that he talked about the Libyan tribes and said that Egypt would um, uh, arm and train Libyan tribes, which effectively bypasses the LNA and, and gave an indication about how Cairo views uh, Khalifa Haftar at the moment. 
I would say the LNA still matters, um, and it's early to know whether there will be a change in its leadership or not. Uh, definitely succession will be tough because it will need uh, and, and sort of require um, a, a mutual understanding and an agreement between a multitude of Libyan actors, but also foreign uh, supporters of, of the LNA and the Eastern authorities. Um, I think more generally, there will be a more focus on the political track where someone like Agila Saleh, the head of the uh, parliament, the House of Representatives in, in Eastern Libya, would play a more important role uh, than the, the role played by Khalifa Haftar. Thank you uh, very uh, much, very much. Uh, Shilif. Shilif. You've hinted towards uh, the implications of both the Cairo Initiative and CC's recent statement last Saturday uh, to troops. And, they would appear to both simultaneously propose de-escalation whilst at the same time threatening direct intervention. Um, how do you assess the Egyptian position with regards to the priorities you've outlined? Is military conflict inevitable? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily see a contradiction between uh, the Cairo initiative that was laid out uh, earlier this month and um, uh, President Sisi's uh, speech last weekend. Um, in fact, they go both uh, hand in hand. I think there's a significance in the sequence of Egypt's moves in, in recent weeks. So first was the, the Cairo declaration on the 6th of June uh, regarding a, a political solution uh, in Libya along the lines of the initiative that was already proposed by the head of parliament, Agila Saleh, um, in, in April. Um, and then came Sisi's speech uh, uh, and the threat of intervention. And this followed the fact that the, the initiative, the earlier initiative was rejected by the GNA, which gave indication, and the GNA gave indications that it will, it, it is committed to, um, uh, to, to go ahead with its plan to enroach on the LNA held territories in Central and Eastern Libya. Um, so then came Sisi's speech uh, and, and the threat of intervention and the goal here was really to communicate Egypt's um, uh, priorities and interests and red lines. Um, and the, the fact that it would not tolerate a transfer of the conflict from Western Libya to Eastern Libya near the Egyptian borders. Um, more broadly, I think Egypt prefers a political solution to the, to the ongoing uh, conflict uh, based on the current territorial control lines um, um, mainly uh, with, with that line uh, being drawn in, in, in central Libya, as, as Sisi has, uh, has uh, mentioned. Um, I think, more, I mean, it's, it's even the difficult nature of, of the Libyan conflict itself and the likely difficult exit from it. Uh, I think Egypt doesn't prefer uh, uh, to, to intervene militarily and uh, uh, it, it, its priority is to find a political solution to the, to the conflicts, again, along the, uh, based on the, the current territorial lines, um, but also because Egypt doesn't like to uh, sort of involve its army in extensive foreign missions. And we've seen that already in 2015 with the Yemen, with the war in Yemen, um, but also the signal that it wanted to give, I mean, the, the, the main message of, of the threat is to, to, to signal to the GNA side and to Turkey, but also to the international community um, that Egypt is prepared to deploy troops uh, yeah. of Libya to protect its interests in case um, its, uh, its initiative or its um, peaceful initiative or, or sort of uh, proposal is not uh, accepted by the GNA and Turkish side. Thank you. And, and just finally, um, Talking about sort of the, the you've, you've talked very well about the sort of legitimate national security concerns for Egypt and the, the real uh, need to ensure uh, for them that the political uh, order in, or the political leadership in the East is not in their view influenced by Islamists. Looking at the red line specifically in the Sirth Jofra uh, area that's been outlined and you mentioned very uh, clearly that the oil crescent uh, is in part uh, a major um, a major part of that reasoning. Do you think there's room within a political negotiation or ceasefire settlement where these areas, Sirt, Jofra and the Oil Crescent are up for negotiation in any way? Or do you think that those red lines are really set in stone for Egypt to, to protect its, its interests? 
Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. I mean, the 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 signs we've seen from the GNA so far um, are that they are committed to uh, mm -hmm. to build on the momentum that they've had and uh, continue their their effort to control uh, CERT and Jofra and possibly move beyond that to the eastern oil fields. And that's that's a key concern for for the GNA because. As I mentioned, since since January 2020, uh, there has been this this uh, LNA-led blockade of, of oil exports from Libya, and that has really hurt uh, the the revenue that uh, the GNA is getting from from oil sales. Again, the oil and gas is is the major um, sort of uh, source of, of of foreign currency income for, for Libya. So, one of its goals is 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 to 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 take control of these oil fields in order to restart oil production and exports. Um, and again, that to Egypt is a red line, as 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 uh, as CC has uh, has mentioned. I mean, mm -hmm. generally, I would say more instability in eastern Libya means more smuggling activity and potential infiltration of militants and and terrorist elements into Egypt, um, which is which is why Egypt is acting this way. I mean, prevent also preventing a hostile environment, a hostile sorry, a hostile government. Um, that uh, that controls eastern Libya and that has Islamist elements that enjoy again enjoy uh, support from Turkey and Qatar um, is is a major uh, priority for Egypt and also if we look at the sort of controversial um, maritime demarcation um, uh, agreement between Turkey and the GNA last November um, it also concerns a short part of the coastline in eastern Libya. Mm -hmm. uh, with Egypt and its implementation uh, uh, would, would potentially upset Egypt's ambitions um, in, in the East uh, Med uh, 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 gas dynamics that we're seeing uh, at the moment. Um, also, I mean, the, 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 these concerns um, since, since 2014 uh, were the driver behind the fact that Egypt has supported the LNA since then, uh, just given Haftar's anti-Islamist and anti-Muslim Brotherhood agenda and his efforts to fight local and transnational um, uh, militant and terrorist groups in Derna and Benghazi, uh, which have been a major concern for Egypt um, um, and, and the security of the border. I think more recently, Haftar's military defeat in Western Libya compels Egypt to move beyond Haftar to engage with a, a wider range mm. of military actors to ensure an adequate uh, political and military order and a stable one, more importantly, in Eastern Libya and through fostering a political solution that kind of preserves the status quo as we see it at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Sharif. I have no doubt that we will return again to, to Libya um, as the discussion goes on. Um, Moving slightly uh, and uh, to Sharif Mohiddin, um, the insurgency obviously uh, in North Sinai continues uh, along with a complete halt of tourism uh, after the, uh, the lockdowns were introduced um, with the global economy downturn with the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, could you just outline uh, what the current status of Sinai communities and tribes are, both as they relate to the pandemic and the security situation in the area? Uh, just having some tiny technical issues. Um, I'm muting. Sharif, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay. Um, we're just going to shift things around a bit. We're having a tiny technical difficulty. Um, and move to uh, just as an important issue, Ethiopia and the GERD and Mahmoud. Um, sorry, um, Mahmoud, thank you. Um, very briefly, there's been a flurry of activity, uh, not just in the last few weeks, but in the last several months on GERD. And, um, and uh, could you just give us an update on where the parties stand 
on negotiations over the dam. Uh, we've seen the collapse of the Washington process and the internal tripartite process last week and the UN Security Council appeal. Um, what are your expectations in the coming weeks prior to a fill um, on the, uh, the, the summer 220, uh, 2020 reservoir fill uh, for the dam? Uh, first, thank you, Hafsa. Uh, thank you for having me, and uh, it's really an honor and pleasure to uh, to be with you and to see you. Um, uh, let me start with a very brief background about the uh, negotiations and what happened since the collapse of Washington negotiations. Uh, uh, the, basically, the, the negotiation, uh, the, the Washington negotiations stopped or collapsed in late February uh, of this year. Since then, Sudan has played uh, a significant role to bring all the parties together. Uh, they asked both Ethiopia and Egypt to, uh, to come to negotiations again, and they provided uh, like a, a paper or uh, a, an agreement based on uh, the points that the three parties agreed on in Washington process. Um, the three parties come to, uh, they started negotiations again, uh, early uh, as this June, and uh, the, the had, um, and for the first time in negotiation, they had observers uh, from uh, uh, from the EU and from South Africa. Uh, previously, they had the World Bank and the US, but this time they had also uh, uh, observers from the European Union and South Africa as the head of the African Union. Um, however, after the, uh, this uh, last round of negotiation, the negotiation failed for uh, three reasons. Uh, the first reason is that th the, the, the three party couldn't agree uh, on the legality of the agreement. Egypt and Sudan wanted to wanted a binding agreement that, in that includes a resolution mechanism for any future problems, uh, but Ethiopia rejected that. Uh, also, Egypt and Sudan uh, wanted to include a mitigation measures for drought and prolonged dry, dry years, and also Ethiopia rejected that. Uh, uh, the one thing that, that, that was kind of new uh, in the last round of negotiations that Egypt wanted to add or to mention its, uh, to mention its historical rights, its histori historical water rights in the, in the agreement, uh, and, Ethiopia, and, Ethiopia, and Ethiopia firmly uh, rejected that and said that they basically they are negotiating, they are negotiating uh, uh, the, water, the, 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 the Renaissance Dam operation, not anything else. Uh, to go back to your question of like, where is the stand? What, what, where is each country and what is the current stand? Um, basically, um, the, the, the three countries, let's, let me start with Ethiopia first. Ethiopia uh, affirmed several times that they're going to fill uh, uh, the reservoir of the Renaissance Dam, whether they have an agreement with uh, Egypt or Sudan or not. Uh, also, Ethiopia uh, moved the heavily military equipment near the Renaissance Dam, and uh, its deputy army chief uh, said that the country will defend itself over the dam, and he also added that Egyptians and the rest of the world knows too well uh, how, how we conduct war whenever it comes. Uh, so this is kind of like a, um, an increase or like a, a more uh, hostile environment between the three countries when it comes to uh, using military force. Uh, just for a, a very historical note, Egypt and Ethiopia had two wars in history, uh, one of them was in 1875, and the second one was 1876, and Egypt lost both wars. Uh, uh, to, to go back to, uh, uh, and also the, uh, in the same line within like the militarizing the talks between the countries, uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Abiy Ahmed uh, said, like, mentioned, like he met with the, uh, uh, early this month in June, uh, he met with the generals from the army, and he said, like the, the, the main the main idea was to discuss new defense strategy. And early this year, in January or February, he mentioned in in, in a speech in um, uh, in the Ethiopian parliament that uh, if and he said specifically, if there is a need to go to war, uh, we could get millions threaded. Uh, 
if uh, and 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 that was like kind of the the talks when it comes to military so we have and the third point uh, from Ethiopia that there is some change uh, uh, in the negotiations uh, they have basically have, they have been talking for years about electricity in recent weeks uh, we have I've been seeing some change both in the Ethiopian media as well in the uh, uh, as well as in the uh, uh, government official uh, 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 interviews. They mentioned that they also need part of from the water. Uh, that that was never an issue before. Uh, that might this 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 might be uh, a card that the Ethiopian government is using to to uh, to make pressure on. Uh, on the Sudanese and Ethiopians and uh, Sudanese and Egyptian side, and it might be a genuine request from them that they need part from the water. They also mentioned this in the UN Security Council letter that they submitted early this month, uh, or like like not early this month, like few few like days ago. Uh, they mentioned that they don't get any water from the from the Blue Nile, and they want to have uh, part from this water. So this is where Ethiopia stands. Uh, to go to go to Egypt and where Egypt stands right now, we have basically three points uh, that can summarize Egypt's stand. Uh, uh, first, that Egypt uh, wants an agreement before fulfilling. Uh, they said that several times. Uh, President Sisi said it. Uh, Samah Shukri, uh, uh, the foreign ministry, said it several times that uh, there would be no filling without an agreement. Uh, this is the first point. The second point is Egypt submitted a letter to uh, the UN Security Council asking them to interfere to affirm the importance of the three countries to resume the negotiations. Uh, the, and they didn't ask, Samah Shokri said in an interview that they don't want the, the, the Security Council to take any sanctions against Ethiopia. They just want them to, to, to ask them to go back to negotiations again. Uh, so this is uh, when it, this is the second point. The third point is that President Sisi, as you might all know, visited a military uh, base a few days ago, and uh, he mentioned both Ethiopia and Libya in his speech. And he said, and he and he urged the army to be ready to accomplish any missions, whether here within the within the borders of Egypt or in or outside if needed. Uh, so this is also one of the things that uh, Egypt is like hinting or giving us signals that they can use force if needed. Uh, when it comes to Sudan, this is the, the stand of Sudan. This is them witnessed the most significant. The, the, the Sudan was like the country that witnessed most most significant change during the period from the, since the collapse of Washington process up until now. Sudan for years have been leaning toward to Ethiopia side. Uh, the oh, they has been always like like sympathized or supporting Ethiopia, whether they said it publicly or not. The me, the, the Sudanese media used to support the Ethiopian side most of not all the time. We have seen a significant change in this. Uh, uh, Sudan recently since, I would say since May, uh, they started to, uh, uh, to basically uh, be as close as possible to Egypt's side. They said that they don't want uh, first filling without an agreement. Uh, they rejected Ethiopia's offer several times to come to uh, like to come to uh, an agreement between Ethiopia and Sudan without Egypt. Uh, they rejected uh, negotiations between the, uh, uh, Ethiopian offer to have a uh, negotiation between Ethiopia and Sudan without Egypt. So they basically try and they submitted early this morning, they submitted a letter to uh, the UN Security Council uh, arguing uh, that the three countries uh, should come uh, again to negotiations and no country should take a unilateral uh, uh, action. Uh, so this is where the three uh, parties stand at the moment. Um, the, 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 the second part of your question of what is the uh, possible 
uh, the expectation prior the uh, possible uh, reservoir filling, uh, I think there are like three uh, possible things that, that, that can happen uh, during the upcoming few weeks. First, uh, or the expectations. First, Egypt will try to win support as much as possible from both African and international players. Uh, to win diplomatic support that can make pressure as much as possible in Ethiopia, not to 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 uh, to stop them from the first filling. Second, uh, we uh, are waiting for this the the, the the UN Security Council resolution, which will be very. Uh, it's not going to be binding. Uh, it's very unlikely to be binding. Uh, 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 solution or uh, resolution from 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 the, the the Security Council, but it's going to be a step forward towards uh, like uh, uh, asking the parties to come again to to an agreement. The third expectation that Ethiopia will try to win Sudan back again. They have been trying and they have been trying. They had this visit for uh, Hamidito and to to, uh, to to Ethiopia a few days ago. So the Ethiopia will try as much as possible to win Sudan back, and we'll see whether Sudan will accept uh, the offers or not. But it's not very clear, and it's very unlikely that Sudan will go back, especially if we kept in mind the tensions, the military tensions between the two countries in the south of Sudan, between Ethiopia and, and Sudan. Thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud. And, and just building a little bit on that, the, the Sudanese have been really quite clear in, in the Arab League and in other forums that they really want to avoid an Arab-African wars, as they call it, or any kind of conflict. As you mentioned, we've seen Ethiopia mass troops to, uh, around the dam structure and towards the border, and, and Egypt has been you know, effectively flexing its muscles that it can uh, engage militarily. Um, the, the rainy season is set to begin in, in a matter of weeks, and without projecting, uh, predicting, sorry, what you think uh, definitely will or won't. Just very, very quickly, um, because I want to ask about the water security issue as well. Um, do you think that um, any sort of military engagement on either side is, um, is possible? I, I think I think for um, I think for Egyptians it is uh, it's uh, I, I don't think the regime can can uh, deal with a water crisis uh, water crisis for Egypt is basically um, no one can afford this uh, just to give you a very very small uh, number to, to to show you how how Egypt is really like way below the the, poverty, the water poverty line. Uh, Egypt, like the, the water poverty line is that uh, each, each person uh, should have at least uh, uh, one 1,000 cubic meter uh, per year. Uh, and we have Egypt that its, that its population is 100 million and they receive 55 uh, million cubic meters. So if we, if we do this math, like between the numbers, between the water that Egypt receives and the, the, the populations in Egypt, Egypt is way, way below the, 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 the international poverty line. Uh, I, I don't think at all that, 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 that Egypt, no matter how strong or brutal the regime is, can, can, can afford to silence people when it comes to water. Uh, just to give you very, very small, uh, like the two examples, the, the first one is that when they asked Sadat uh, about the same issue uh, in the late 70s, he said that I'm not going to watch my people die here. I will take them and die there. Uh, so this is, this is just to give you a context of how the Egyptians, like through the history uh, and the current regime that basically uh, uh, successor to previous regimes comes from the same ideology or from the, the same... Uh, background, it's one of the main things in, in, in Egypt, uh, na national security, water is one of the main, main things. Uh, indeed, and um, just uh, very, very quickly, obviously one of the arguments is that, as you mentioned, water poverty, water insecurity is a major issue, one that will continue to be, um, one that will continue to be a 
carrying the country uh, regardless of the dam issue. Um, it will continue to uh, have uh, questions over water efficiency, usage, wastage, etc. cetera, are, um, are certainly very much a part of the national discourse and debate, um, but also climate change and the Nile waters. Um, how do you see Egypt's water security policy has evolved in recent years? And, and how would you describe the response to water insecurity domestically? Uh, okay, um, just to start with laying out what is the problem when it comes to water security in Egypt and to Egypt problems with uh, climate change. Um, the problem can, we can we can summarize it in a very few points. For years, uh, as as I mentioned uh, earlier, Egypt is already under the poverty line when it comes to under the water poverty line when it comes to water. Um, so for years or for decades, I would say, uh, Egyptian regimes have been like giving there, there have been an extreme poor management, uh, poor water management in Egypt. Uh, we have an irrigation system that uh, is the same as uh, ancient Egyptian. Nothing changed, uh, no modernization whatsoever when it comes to the irrigation system, with, which takes more than 80% uh, from Egypt's water. Uh, this is first. Second, water used to be almost for free. Uh, in Egypt, until like maybe like 10 or 15 years ago, they started to have price on water. Before that, it was almost free for everyone. Uh, uh, irrigation canals that people use to to have water to to uh, that goes to farms and uh, uh, places like that that British created more than 100 years ago. No one uh, did anything to modernize it or to uh, sustain it in any way. Uh, and, and when it comes, and also to add to this, uh, Egypt Delta, uh, which is the northern part of Egypt, is already just one meter above the sea water. Uh, so Egypt is already in a very bad situation when it comes to water management. Um, the, the current government or the current regime has been taking like several steps uh, 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 like to overcome these challenges. Uh, uh, the first thing that the, uh, that the, the current uh, regime or the current government has been doing is that uh, the parliament approved several laws to ban cultivation of certain crops that takes lots of water, such as rice, in certain areas in Egypt. Uh, also, the current government built a lot of uh, desalination plants. Uh, uh, and to give you a number uh, to show you what is the difference between uh, how, how much the desalination plants have been built. Uh, Egypt used to have 80,000 cubic meter per year from the desalination plant before, before the current government. Now it have almost 800,000. So this, this has been the increase uh, from 80,000 to 800,000 cubic meters. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, Egypt start uh, Egypt started this program. The current the current government announced this like in, in early 2018 that they're going to use the irrigation water at least three times. Uh, and the final thing that the government is doing is that they, they announced in, in 2018 that uh, they're going to modernize the irrigation system in Egypt uh, in 10 years. Uh, they started. They started this program, and uh, it's it's not clear what is the progress in in, 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 in the program that they meant that they announced, and uh, to uh, to modernize the irrigation system. But it's this is what they said in 2018. My opinion, uh, to end with this, my opinion is that the government is um, uh, taking steps. It's very 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 small compared to the the, the problem. The problem is quite huge, and it's even I would say like it's way even bigger than Libya. Uh, and uh, because like, as I mentioned, like Egypt is basically nothing without water. If you don't have water in Egypt, it would be all desert and people like eco economy and everything would be most, most likely collapse. So I think the, and also you add to this, the, the population growth and, and how that eats from the water ratio that, that it's already limited or it's already very small to Egypt. Uh, so I think the government is taking a step, but still very, very way to go.
Thank you very much uh, to Sharif, uh, to sorry, Mahmoud and moving to Sharif. Uh, just before I ask Sharif to come in, just a reminder that you can submit your questions um, as and when, uh, as I said, by email at middleeast at ceip.org or in the chat box uh, on next to the uh, YouTube screen. So uh, Sharif Mohideen, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for your patience while we sorted that technical difficulty. Um, so just to start again, moving now back to um, marginalized communities and starting in the Sinai. Uh, as I said, um, obviously we've seen that the insurgency is continuing in North Sinai and with the effects of COVID-19, we've seen a complete halt to tourism across the peninsula, particularly of course in South Sinai. Um, just give us an update on the status of the Sinai communities and tribes, both in relation to the pandemic um, and uh, regarding the security situation in the area. Thank you, Hafsa. Uh, actually, Sinai, Sinai people have been living under like uh, uh, between a hammer and anvil for so long. And now also they are facing the global pandemic. North Sinai has been under lockdown uh, for years, way before the pandemic has started. It's, it was also, it, it was due uh, the war on terrorism. Uh, and now it's, it seems ironic, but it's time, it might be time to pay off a little, hopefully, because uh, not of course justifying the deadly measures and normalizing the exceptional rules, but since the first the military operation uh, uh, started there like uh, eight years ago in, in August, 2012, Unlike most parts of, of Egypt, uh, North Sinai is uh, the, the last place in all over Egypt that it has announced the COVID-19 cases uh, uh, with, with the first positive case. It was uh, late April, 30 April, and the first death of the virus, it was in June, uh, this June uh, at, on, on the 11th. So far, the pandemic has not hit Sinai, the whole Sinai Peninsula, North and South, the way it hit Cairo. Now we are having uh, almost 100 cases, and this is like, uh, according to uh, last week, uh, from uh, both North and South Sinai uh, health, health officials. And it seems that it, the pandemic can be controlled in, in Sinai, in North Sinai uh, uh, specifically. It can be controlled uh, and we have like a, a, a lot of chances to control it more than Cairo for so many reasons. I think the pandemic spread uh, will rely on uh, two specific points. Uh, how the operation of the land crossings with Israel and Gaza on the north and the second point, it's about the, the resuming the tourism to the South Sinai. If extra care and like the necessary tests and precautions are followed, Sinai can survive from the pandemic uh, like no, no other place uh, in Egypt. Regarding the security situation, uh, it sure has been upgraded lately comparing to uh, the chaotic previous year since 2013. Yes, there has been like a major incident or two incidents every month. I mean, uh, ter terrorist attacks. But if we take a deep look, uh, uh, we will find that the location of these incidents are no longer inside the cities or the villages. And also it's basically like hit and run styles and using the bombing uh, devices rather than the full engagement that we have witnessed in 2013 and 2014, and it, which ha has led to like, uh, uh, deadly uh, this this toll. Based on my research, I think also uh, many of the mega and most deadly terrorist attacks it occurred in July, uh, since the removal of Morsi in July 2013, and also way before that, uh, 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 it was in Sharm Sheikh the most de deadly attack happened. The most ter terrorist attack happened in all over Egypt before the Arab Spring. It was on July 23rd which is the anniversary of uh, uh, the army officers taking uh, the regime in 1952. Uh, so it was the biggest and the deadliest attack. It happened in Sharm Sheikh in 2005. And after this, we have also uh, the 1st of July, which is like, uh, uh, it can be uh, described as like uh, the deadliest battle in, after Yom Kippur in 1973. 
this was the deadliest battle, but it was inside, uh, not a war with an, a foreign country. It was with ISIS, with the Light Sinai. And this happened in uh, the 1st of July, 2015. So fingers crossed that July can like passes in Sinai and all over Egypt as much peaceful as it can get. And I'm, I'm so hopeful about this year. It's, it's, it's the pandemic, of course, but the security challenges in, in Sinai, it can, it can be defeated this year. Thank you, Sharif. And just to touch on that, <clears throat> sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, j just to build on that, you know, you've um, interestingly highlighted that July seems to be the most, uh, uh, the, the month of, of significant activity. Uh, but in, in terms uh, the ISIS uh, Sinai province, the ISIS offshoot that is in uh, in northern Sinai. Uh, what's your assessment of the current uh, potency of the group and um, the Egyptian military's uh, offensive to uh, to root out uh, the militancy there? All right, that's that's a fantastic question. Thank you, Hafsa, for asking it. I think North Sinai people main challenge is to basically to live a normal life after the chaotic years. It is important also for like internal audience to get an idea about what has been going in Sinai for all, all of the years. The whole war uh, on terror in Sinai Peninsula it has been going deadly for like uh, almost eight years, but only to specific parts of North Sinai, which is like accounts like uh, not more than 5% of the total uh, uh, size of the Sinai Peninsula. I do hope that Egypt announced the military victory over Wolaid Sinai before the end of ongoing year. And I'm sure it can, but uh, the real threat, not just from military defeating the Wolaid Sinai. I think the real threat comes from the radicalization process of people who witnessed like human rights violation during all of this war, uh, and in the name of the war against terrorism, of course. If the regime is serious about defusing such bombs and defeating uh, uh, the ideology, uh, the same way it's really seeking to defeat it military, I think some of like brave steps, it, 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 it would be so much needed. So, because we all know uh, during, during wars, a lot of mistakes happen. And for sure, a lot of mistakes happened uh, uh, during all of these eight years. So acknowledging those mistakes and addressing Sinai people with uh, a different narrative and different discourse, including them more in reality, not just, you know, figure of speech. I think acknowledging such mistakes and addressing it is the key challenge for everyone. Sinai people to be able to uh, get back to uh, to the normal life without any fears, and also the Egyptian army to be able to defeat Wolai Sinai post ideology and, of course, uh, uh, military. I think also one of the main current challenges for the army nowadays is uh, the growing threat coming from the western uh, uh, borders with with the Libyan. So even so, the army announced it like killing Hisham Ashmawi, who, who was the terrorist mega mind behind many of the deadliest attacks in Egypt. But Hisham Ashmawi's strategy seemed to, because he moved to Libya and he got captured in Libya and then Egypt succeeded in transferring him back uh, to Egypt and then they hanged him earlier this year. I think one of uh, uh, the key themes of Hisham Ashmawi's strategy is to get the Egyptian army distracted uh, uh, within and with uh, with Libya and with also the borders with Libya. And even so, Hisham Ashmao is off now, he's killed, but it seems that it might, uh, his strategy, it might get working now with the current updates from Libya. I see no, no big harm of having like the Egyptian army on a standby situation now with uh, the updates on Libyan conflict. But I think also, as we are uh, following up, the political leadership is seeking a de-escalation uh, for the whole conflict, as you mentioned before, and as Sharif also mentioned, and not risking a wide involve involvement in, in, uh, of the Egyptian army crossing the border. 
which would have great cost not not only to the Egyptian army and the Egyptian troops participating, but of course also to uh, uh, to it would affect uh, Sinai and it would affect also the south border as well. Thank you, Sharif. And um, and on that note, moving uh, to the southern border, you, uh, you've you recently released a report with Carnegie on the Egypt-Sudan relationship, and I thoroughly encourage people to, to read it. Um, and the effect on, on the Nubian communities, and you've provided some, some guidance and, and recommendations uh, related to both uh, the, the border crossing itself, but also the movement and the long uh, held uh, attempt for the right of return. Just very, very briefly, if you could highlight um, your observations from your research and the main issues with the Egypt-Sudan relationship and that border uh, between uh, Egypt and Sudan. And yes, sure. sure, my pleasure. Uh, actually, to make it very briefly, even so the popular relations between Egyptian and Sudanese people are based on mutual respect and peaceful coexistence. I think I try to shed some light on the sources of the hidden conflict. The hidden conflict that it keeps uh, are just arising to the surface every now and then when the media, for an instance, focuses on the uh, Halab and Shalatin disputed areas and when it comes also to the GRD, Ethiopian Dam, and the Nile conflict. The main reasons underlying the conflict based on my research findings are four reasons since Sudan independence in 1956. The first reason is the tightened security uh, uh, over border and restriction of movement of people out, out of the country uh, uh, from Egypt and inside the country as well. And it has accelerated with, after two, two, 2013, it has accelerated with imposing more visa restriction between the two countries. That goes actually against the four freedoms treaties that both countries ha, uh, have signed on 2004. The second reason is the displacement of Egyptian and Sudanese Nubian after building the high uh, dam uh, back at the 1960s where Nubian families, uh, after the construction of the dam, they got like, we, we got a huge uh, geographical gap uh, uh, across the border. They were leaving and they were feeling more than 300 kilometers of the border. And now they, are, uh, they have moved in Aswan and now they were emigrating to Cairo, Alexandria and other European and the US, uh, uh, to the US also seeking to work and to afford their families. The third uh, source of the conflict, it, which is the conflict, the ongoing conflict over Halaib and Shalatin, the disputed triangle. And especially after 2013, it has increased, uh, uh, the Egyptian army has increased the military presence there. The fourth and the last uh, uh, reason of all of this conflict is the political antagonism between the two regimes, especially since the assassination attempt of Hosni Mubarak's ex-president. Which was, which was commonly believed back then that the Sudanese Omar al-Bashir was behind it. All of these issues has affected, uh, it has it have affected not only Egypt's uh, longest land border, uh, it has with Sudan, which is uh, 200, uh, 200 kilometer and 76, but also uh, it has affected the local borderland communities and it has affected millions of citizens of both uh, countries restricting their movement between the two countries. Yet the fall of Mubarak regime, it really gave way to uh, uh, organized activism uh, within the Nubian communities, both Egyptian and Sudanese. This activism led to more pressure to the regime and with this pressure, it has led to the opening of the first two land crossing between the two countries, which they were used to be one country uh, but they were only relying on the Nile Ferry to cross the borders. Now they are, uh, they have opened the coastal and Orkin uh, land crossings, both 2014 and 2017. But with the closure also of the crossings, those crossing as part of the coronavirus pandemic and lockdown procedures and so on, the two countries need to use this opportunity to bolster the mutual interest that they are having because they are both suffering now from the pandemic, the economic pandemic uh, impacts, and they will unfortunately suffer uh, from this uh, uh, impacts for 
at least uh, two years or something like that. So my, my take on this is the return of Nubians to the border areas could really, really help improving the cross, across border relations as well at a later stage, e both Egypt and Sudan can really revive their discussions on, uh, uh, on like collaboration on some projects like connecting the two countries with uh, railways and electricity and engaging also in opening a third land crossing that you're talking about it for 40 years. Uh, uh. And finally, when it comes to Halaib and Shalatin, this is like the main theme of the conflict to non to public. I think if it really remains like unresolved like this, the potential for more con serious conflict between Egypt and Sudan uh, will remain and will appear. And of course, with this UBI thing, I think it might be a bargain between the two countries that they are pushing each other. So finally, my take on Halab and Shalatin, I think both countries can do smart maneuver and settle down the conflict with striking some special and unique deal agreement that gives the disputed areas, extra service from both countries. And both countries, they can share the gold and mineral wells and resources that they are, going, they are extracting from this disputed area. By doing this, it really, really can make like a breakthrough with the relation, resolving this historical conflict. And of course, it can give an amazing example to the whole Middle East uh, border conflicts how to have like a win-win strategy and resolving conflict with very, very peaceful ways. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. It does. And, uh, and again, it's a very, very good report. Um, thank you to all three of our speakers. Um, we have a, a very number of questions and apologies uh, both to the speakers and to the audience that we may jump around as I'm uh, I'm looking to address uh, them all coming in. So, uh, so apologies if we do sort of jump from Libya to, to Sinai, to Aswan, to Ethiopia and, and so forth. Um, uh, we're gonna go back and loop back to Libya uh, with a question, uh, Sharif, uh, for you. Um, a political solution uh, based on the status quo in Libya is surely a recipe for continued political instability. Uh, the question reads, um, the uh, LNA uh, seems to show no interest in one and reliance on the tribes would be even less stable. Um, the question asks, isn't it more in Egypt's interest to accept and work with, an even, with even an unfriendly GNA that controls the border? Your remarks. Well, I mean, that's, that's an interesting... Uh, <laughs> Indeed. Uh, because... <laughs> I think, I mean, if, if, if let's imagine the scenario whereby uh, the GNA controls all of Libya, um, including the border with Egypt, then there would be no point of, of political solution because that would be the imposed political solution, which uh, the LNA maybe tried to, to, uh, uh, to advance when it, uh, when it launched its, its Tripoli offensive to sort of unify the country under its leadership. Obviously, it didn't work out. And now we're seeing um, sort of the, the, the opposite happening. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, uh, doubtful about the, um, the potential for the GNA forces to actually capture Sirte and Jufra and move into the east. I think, I, think, I mean, the, yes, they, they, they've had many successes in the northwest, um, but now they're risking to be a, a bit overstretched um, and the, the, the LNA forces are still present and um, uh, they are very committed to prevent the GNA from expanding further into uh, Central and, and uh, Eastern Libya. And they are backed by, um, by Russia, by, by Egypt, by the UAE. Um, we're seeing a, a, a deployment or a presence of, of Russian fighters from the Wagner group here that are according to my understanding, are still present in the Jofra Air Base. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I don't see that scenario as, as a likely scenario. Um, and I think, I mean, regarding the appetite for the LNA to negotiate a political solution, I think it has more appetite now because it has an interest in uh, sort of just securing its gains or its, um, let's say, its, its current uh, areas of control. And... Uh, 
reach a political solution based on that um, um, and, and not kind of lose any more territory to the GNA. I think it has more uh, interest in doing that. What we're seeing now is um, perhaps the GNA that uh, kind of just tries to, to build on the military momentum to, to capture more, more ter territory. So it's, it's perhaps a GNA that, is, that has less interest now in negotiating based on the current uh, state of affairs. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have just about 15 minutes. So I'm gonna ask us because to their response. I have one more for Shadi Flash Mary before we move on uh, away from Libya. Um, in your opinion, what are the dynamics between Egypt and Russia regarding Libya and how much do their interests overlap? Yeah, again, that's a great question because the Russian role in Libya has been a, a big enigma, I think, in, in recent years and particularly recent, more recently. I think there, there is a great deal of, uh, of common interests um, uh, in Libya, and we've seen that in recent weeks in the kind of uh, political statements from both governments um, kind of trying to, to, to foster a political solution based on the current territorial uh, control areas. Um, so th th there is a great deal of overlap of um, kind of uh, um, uh, common interest in supporting um, the LNA and kind of trying to find a, a political solution and while supporting the Eastern authorities. However, I would like to highlight the fact that the, the, the interests of Egypt and, and Russia in, uh, in Libya are, are extremely different and, and very divergent uh, in, in, in the sense that um, Russia views Libya as more of an opportunity to project its influence uh, uh, in, in an important country like Libya, but also across North Africa, to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to have a, a presence south of Europe and to, um, uh, to be... Uh, present or to have an influence in, in a country where Turkey is present and uh, that, that, that could give Russia leverage in any uh, negotiations between Turkey and, and Russia uh, over Syria, for example, but also for economic benefits uh, down the road. While for Egypt, it's, 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 a, it's a direct national security issue and just given, given the, the, um, the massive border between the two, the two countries, uh, it's a, it, it, Egypt sees uh, the current dynamics in Libya as more of a threat than an, an opportunity. I think even with the, with the threat to intervene in Libya, Egypt, I don't think it's interested in sort of um, having long-term economic gains in Libya. I mean, the economic gains would, 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 would be something, but it's not the priority of Egypt. But also it has no interest in uh, occupying Eastern Libya, let's say. Uh, its, it's key uh, priority is uh, security. And that's, I think that's, that's probably the, the benefit or the, uh, the advantage that Russia has because it has more leeway in dealing with Libya as it doesn't suffer any consequences from instability there. Uh, Hafsa, I want to add a, a very small point. I'm, here. I'm coming, sure. I want you to also answer within your response briefly. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions on this idea that the uh, or this uh, possibility that the recent statements on uh, Libya are some kind of way to divert attention from the GERD and from the, the Ethiopia question and the idea of, of no resolution on the dam. Uh, how do you think the dispute on the Nile, if it has any way to influence on calculations with an intervention in Libya, um, you know, does one side imply, you know, does one uh, policy of action on one side imply action on another one? Uh. Well, I, I think, yes, um, I, I think uh, Egypt can't afford to have basically two wars and this conflict in Sinai at the same time. Um, like, mm. uh, historically speaking, when, when, when Egypt does have this, they basically, um, uh, no military can, can, can afford this, like, let alone we have like the Egyptian military, uh, has been not like tested in wars while the uh, 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 like for years uh, since uh, like an actual actual war since uh, seventy three. Uh, since then, there were there has been no like very like military action. So we, we and, and there have been like several reports on how uh, 
uh, efficient the, uh, the 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 military is in, in, in Sinai. So we like to have three or to have two open wars at the same time. This is a very very uh, dangerous situation that uh, 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 if Egypt choose if if, if the Egyptian government uh, uh, choose to to do so, it would be. Uh, one of the riskiest uh, uh, decisions that uh, a decision maker can take. Um, uh, so I th I think uh, for now, like like from the Egyptian point, Egypt still have more time to maneuver and to give like make more pressure on Ethiopia when it comes to diplomatic and uh, 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 or if the if the if the, if the security council come up with a resolution that asks for negotiations to come back and then they have another step that to, to sanction Ethiopia or to prevent Ethiopian uh, goods or Ethiopian ships to cross from this uh, canal Suez because if Egypt is in a war with a country it, like legally they have according to uh, the Constanti uh, the Constantinia uh, uh, agreement uh, the Egypt can like stop or uh, prevent right. ships that comes from countries that Egypt has war with to to use the Suez Canal. So there are like some tools that Egypt can use uh, internationally to to pressure Ethiopia, and I think the deal is not very hard to get. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have today like a very clear like Sudan put uh, an outline for a deal and they submitted this morning to the, the, the Security Council and it's very clear that countries can come together uh, uh, so uh, yeah thank you uh, Mahmoud um, my eye is just on the clock so I have a question for uh, Sharif uh, Mohideen and then a question for all the speakers and I apologize to um, people who, who may not uh, see their, their questions answered, but I, I understand that you know, we've, we've taken up time already from people's days and, and greatly appreciate uh, the audience um, that also wary that we should end on time. Um, Sharif, a question that's come in for you is, um, Sharif Mohideen, sorry. Um, is the, uh, the current decline that you noted of the potency of terrorist groups and militant activity in Sinai, how much do you think reflective Egyptian government counterterrorism measures, or is it related to the defeat of ISIS in Syria territorially? Uh, other factors um, you can point to? Well, I think uh, it's, it's very difficult to give to give like a definite uh, answer for this question. It's so many reasons has uh, mm -hmm. contributed to just giving us such like less uh, uh, tricky and less mess uh, uh, compared to the, uh, uh, the previous years. The, uh, once there was like a, a, a high uh, wave of uh, terrorism and political violence. So I do think like the strategy by the Egyptian military, it finally worked, uh, uh, but to go through all the steps, there are a lot of uh, things that could have been avoided as well. Mm -hmm. And I do think as well, uh, 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 the factor of the defeat of ISIS, it has uh, contributed a little, but uh, I don't think this is like the major factor uh, of this because we are having uh, Ansar amounts way before Wadai Sinai. And of course, uh, Hisham Ashmawi contributed a lot and then he uh, uh, disagreed with uh, with the militias and left to Libya. But it was also uh, 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 he was using some strategy to distract the Egyptian army. So a lot, a lot of reasons and factors. But we we can't name one factor uh, for it. But I think it would be we'll, all of us will be so glad if we can finally defeat the Wallachian Sinai in this year. But, yeah, do you want to say something? Thank you. Also? No, no, no. Sorry, okay. sorry, I'll yeah. let you finish. No, no. no. Sorry. So, so just to finish this, uh, uh, I think to go and do a lot of research into this, because all, we all know it's, it's like a kind of a black box. But for example, uh, uh, it has been only this year, at the beginning of this year, specifically, if I, I recall, it was the uh, 24th of January, 
the first like uh, 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 Congress members and staff, they have uh, been to Arish. And I think this, uh, it's a big and it's a huge step comparing to previous years. It was very, very difficult to get any access, any uh, like external access, even from Cairo uh, mm -hmm. to have some official visiting Arish and staying and for a day or something like that. I think it couldn't uh, happen before before this year. So I do hope for this year, yeah, it's it's the corona and stuff, but I do hope for this year, the war uh, against terrorism in Egypt will be like, it will succeed a little. Thank you, uh, Sharif. Uh, so the closing question uh, for all of you, and uh, I'm gonna give you a minute each to respond. Um, is uh, dealing with the pandemic and the global economic rece uh, recession and sort of the, the massive effects that are very much out of Egypt's control um, at the moment, how does it affect the Egyptian government's ability to deal with Libya and or Ethiopia and or Sinai and, and how so? Um, if we start with Sharif Mohideen, then Mahmoud, and then end with Sharif Lashmawi. Uh, I think Egypt, uh, as the last couple of weeks since uh, uh, since it started to take like serious measures with the Corona in on in March, I think we have acquired so far uh, about 13 billion dollars uh, assistance, foreign assistance to deal with the Corona stuff. So I think it would be more than enough to continue like with all of this assistance till the end of the year. Uh, but if, if God forbid the coronavirus like uh, stayed with us for another year, I think it will be uh, uh, it will be hectic and it would be consuming uh, a lot with the economic dealing with the economic impacts. But it's not quite it's not so much related in my my opinion because the decision to go into Libya or to go with Ethiopia or to go with any other conflict it's not basically economically to Egypt because. If, if the regime really want to go, they will go uh, no matter what. So I think the current strategy is working to being defensive, to alerting the army, like this, like CC mentioned a couple of days ago, and visited like the troops on the western borders. I think to be defensive, that's, that's very good. But if we engage in some like wide wars or uh, whatever battles uh, crossing the border with Libya or whatever, I think it would be consuming a lot and it will like affect the economy of the country so much. Thank you, Sharif Mahmoud, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hafsa. Uh, I, I, I would say like uh, uh, the uh, pandemic and the economic effect of the pandemic uh, uh, affected uh, uh, Egypt's uh, ability to deal with, uh, uh, affected Egypt's ability to deal with, this, with the Ethiopian conflict and uh, it will affect the, the how the, Egypt, the, the Egyptian uh, regime can deal with the conflict in the future. Uh, now we're having a health problem that it's uh, really Egypt is uh, the numbers of infection have been has been inc have been increasing for uh, uh, this month. Uh, this month alone, the, the numbers increased for two hundred and almost fifty percent. Uh, so um, you have this problem, which is a health problem, which which affected significantly uh, the economic problem, uh, the, the the economic situation in the country. So uh, adding to this, if the country take an action, either military action, which or or goes into this way of like militarizing the uh, the problem, this will make it extremely heavy uh, on uh, the Egyptian economy uh, while dealing with all of this. Um, uh, if not, if they didn't take an action, this will also have. Uh, if, if they didn't give it a serious attention and they didn't come with an agreement as much as, as possible uh, or as fast as possible, uh, this will a water crisis will add uh, uh, to the current two major problems, uh, which is economic and uh, health uh, problems that Egypt is facing at the moment. So I think the pandemic and the economic uh, implication has affected Egypt quite significantly to deal with it with, with, with the Renaissance Dam problem. 
Thank you, uh, Mahmoud. Uh, Sharif, you'll get the last 30 seconds, so go for it. Thank you, Hafsa. I mean, I mean, as, as, as you described it, I think there is a convergence of, of challenges that Egypt is facing, uh, mega challenges. And, um, but at the same time, we, we, we sometimes tend to forget that um, these kind of challenges have always been present. And um, especially Egypt's uh, environment has always been uh, kind of unstable, and we've we've always faced um, um, uh, uh, challenges on our borders. So I think I think today we're uh, perhaps in, in a better position than uh, before because um, uh, there is a, a decent state capacity to deal with some of these challenges. Um, I think the political stability is definitely uh, um, uh, in a better position than uh, perhaps a few years back. And uh, uh, I, I think dealing with these, challenge, these uh, challenges will, will hugely depend on the state's capacity and ability to mm -hmm. coordinate the responses and sort of give the, the enough resources to each uh, of these challenges uh, 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 to deal with them. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, will, it, will, it will, to a great extent, it will depend on uh, uh, the, the, the government's ability to just coordinate the responses and uh, yeah, to be able to, to, to deal with them uh, in, a, in an efficient way. Thank you very much, uh, Sharif, uh, Sharif and Mahmoud for a, an incredibly interesting discussion. And with everything that's happening, it could go on forever. Uh, to our audience members, I encourage you to, to reach out and continue the conversation. Uh, everyone's on Twitter and we can provide contact information uh, to speak to people directly. I want to thank Carnegie's Middle East program, Dr. Michelle Dunn, and the admin wizard that is Kerry Duganzich for all of their support and help in putting this on. And just a reminder that this is the third and final uh, webinar in the uh, Carnegie's series of Egypt Faces the Pandemic. This will soon be uploaded, but all three will be available to watch via YouTube or the Carnegie website. Thank you again to you and all your loved ones. Stay safe safe, stay healthy, and at this point in lockdown, stay sane. Uh, I wish you all very well, and thank you again to our speakers. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Hafsa. Bye -bye. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.